Right, guys, thanks for coming, folks. We're going to try and keep you all as entertained as we can here for a couple of hours. Um, the, the way I see it, you know, one, you know, it's, it's a fantastic story in 1916, but, you know, one way of looking at it as well is it's also a hugely entertaining story just in terms of its historical... Uh, what's the word? It's, it's just completely compelling. But as, as, as Kevin said, I'm Derek Molyneux. This is Darren Kelly. We're mates the past tour of the years. Complete history. Anorax. Don't even go there. Poor Mark has come out for a few points with his last night. He still has not over. I'd say his ears are probably still ringing. But, you know, we're here today as guests, as Kevin said, at the Sean Houston 1916 Society. It's a great pleasure to, to be here in that regard. Um, I had the, the good fortune of meeting Kevin for the first time last year at, on a, a different sort of a forum and uh, I didn't know him but I found from, from speaking to him for the best part of the day that his knowledge of uh, Irish history, it's, it really is second to none but it's, it's also kind of untainted by vitriol or very very strong opinions in, in that sense. You can sit the guy in a room with, with any, any kind of a group and he'd be a great listener, also a great speaker so in that regard it's a great honour to be here Kevin and I thank you again for Order. Um, Captain Sean Houston himself features quite strongly in the book and I mean, we think deservedly so because um, just across the river from here we had his tenacious defence of the Mendicity Institute which is you know something of a legend to you know history you know, enthusiasts like ourselves but you know what went on over there was the very epitome of close quarter combat now that's what we you know we really we aimed to deal with in the book now so as, as Kevin said, any questions that you have afterwards, we'd be more than happy to take them. Any comments, we'd be more than happy to, to, to discuss as well. Which is now, the Easter Rising, it's one of the most documented conflicts in modern history. So, you know, you could ask why myself and Darren felt the need to, you know, write another book about it. Well, the simple answer is this. We wanted to approach it from a perspective that was as descriptive as possible of the raw experiences that were felt by both sides in the various battles, and there were many battles. We wanted to convey to the reader the sheer horror, the trauma, the elation, and also the crushing emotional desolation that faced those who were immersed in it, whether they were volunteers or otherwise. Now Darren's knowledge of the subject is, you know, it's been based on, you know, it's been accumulated over the past 30 odd years, and um, it's in my own, you know, I've got you know good knowledge, but my input to it was I, I've got an intimate knowledge of Dublin streets based on spending the best part of 20 years working as a motorbike courier. Um, I got to know the streets you know, inside out, which was a great help in, in describing what, what was what, what, how I saw things going on. Um, we wanted to approach this predominantly from the perspective of the combatants. We, we didn't focus on the leaders, That's, we've nothing against them, but it's just that the, we felt that the, the bookshelves are absolutely full of, of you know, books about the leaders. We wanted to get down there with the nitty gritty, with the people who are hiding behind walls and windows, doing that with very little food, very little sleep for the best part of the week, and they're as, as terrified as they were. Um, Darren was, um, he was able to assimilate the information from a wide variety of sources. Uh, the Bureau of Military History in Cattle Brewer Barracks and Rat Mines were very helpful, as were the Imperial War Museum in London. But the level of detail that we wanted to get, to get into it here, Darren ended up consulting the Met Office up in Glass Nevin up the road from here, who were also very helpful because we, want, we even wanted to get the weather reports for every day and night because that was the level of detail that we wanted to inject to get this, to, to make the story. Not that it isn't compelling in itself, but we wanted to, to get in there and drag every bit of intensity out of this and get it out there and throw it in front of people and go, this is your story city this is what happened in it and it's time everybody starts to look at it acknowledge it and appreciate it and commemorate it but as I said you know I, I applied my knowledge uh, on, on top of Dar Darren's you know his, his his research expertise but you know between us we've read volumes and articles dealing with the rising but you know at, at the same time as I said you know, we wanted to inject every bit of energy we could in that regard we took on a military advisor uh, Mike O'Brien was his name now he's very, very familiar with the physical, the mental, and the emotional effects of close quarter combat. You know, in, including the physiological effects of bullet wounds. The guys got a lot of first-hand experience with that. Now, we've really aimed to present the week's events to the reader in as vivid a manner as possible. That's something that I can't emphasize enough. This is something that we really, really, you know, you know, pushed ourselves to do. 
Um, we were hoping to leave the kind of lasting impression that can sometimes, it could sometimes be considered lacking in, I'm not going to slag off more academic works, I think they're brilliant, but I think if you're talking about the likes of teenagers, you know, we've heard reports of, of, of you know, teenagers who've read our book and, and they've absolutely become engrossed in it, and now you know, they're, they're going in, they're looking at the bookshelves, the history shelves in Easton's with, with a completely different viewpoint, wanting to learn more, having had the introduction that, that, that we've given them in, in a way that they seem to, to appreciate. But, you know, we wanted to get the point across that, as well, that the rising, and this is a very, very important point, this was a much more well-planned affair than we felt is generally considered by a great many people. You know, the impression that I was given, you know, back, back you know, many, many moons ago in secondary school and history class, was something along the lines of a bunch of you know poets going in with pistols taking over you know one or two buildings in and around the GPO maybe in, in the Stevens Green and as soon as the British sailed the gunboat you know we, we were given the impression that it was something like a destroyer or a frigate battleship that came up the, the you know the, the, the River Liffey and bombarded the hell out of everybody and they all came out with the, you know with the white flags and we're really really sorry about that and it was only in, in 1919 that things really really kind of kicked off but you know the the, the prologue to the book, we used an extract from Vice Commandant Joseph O'Connor's witness statement. Now, this we felt was an excellent opportunity for us to get precisely this point across, because in the same piece, O'Connor describes in great detail what his own volunteer battalion, the third, was supposed to have at its disposal had the countermand order never materialised, particularly in terms of manpower. They, were, they had planned on having between 800 and 1,000 men at their disposal. They had planned on opposing a British landing in Dunleary. They also had plans to oppose a landing in Dublin Port by putting a boom across between the, the north and the south walls of the Liffey that would have been covered by uh, firing positions. Now, it goes into great detail about how that manpower was to be tactically employed in positions uh, pretty much along the railway line between Tara Street and Dunleary, as I said, to oppose the landing. Never mind, you know, the, if, if their plans had come to fruition, you know, the British would have struggled to even land troops, never mind send battalions in to assault the city itself. Now, we've been told since that, I, I really loved the prologue because it was from the horse's mouth and it does kind of set out a nice and quite ominous atmosphere for the book, particularly with regard to the comment that's made to Joe O'Connor from uh, Lieutenant Michael Malone, but sure, we won't spoil that. Now, close quarter combat was the principal feature of, of what happened in Dublin during Easter week 1916. Of that, there is no doubt. The Irish Defence Forces today, for example, they use the term phibia to describe uh, fighting in built-up areas. That's, that's what, how they refer to the, the hell that is urban combat. Now, I got a good laugh at thinking about this. I mean, the fibia is a word that's often used to describe one of the human shin bones. Now, anybody who's had a good kick of the shins will know just how bloody nasty that is. Now, I mean, you look at the fight, a lot of the fight, particularly around here, you know, that's like somebody grabbing you with a scruff of the collar, headbutting you, kicking you in the shins while they were trying to bite your nose off. That's the sort of... Uh, intensity and the, the you know what I mean, the, the, that's what we wanted to convey. This was up close, this was personal, and at times this was bloody brutal. You know, up close, personal, in no small part carried out within pistol, shotgun, hand grenade range, fighting like this, it's the most feared form of combat of any soldier. Go and ask them, they don't like the idea of it. For most of the British infantrymen, it was awful. They were trained for trench warfare where an enemy was generally at a calculable distance. They knew he was going to be over there. You know, but, but when they came to Dublin, you know, what awaited them was uh, you know, well-trained, hugely motivated volunteers. I, I have to emphasise, hugely. These guys paid for their own guns. They paid for their own uniforms. You know, a lot of them felt that they had very little to lose. Some of them were quite well off financially. Some of them had come from you know, near, near destitute backgrounds. But you know, they were motivated for all sort, sorts of reasons. But the fact is, these guys were motivated. The, the British soldiers had to face them from the streetscape of an unfamiliar built-up city. Take a look around outside the streets here, look into, into Red Cow Lane just outside. There was a hell of a scrap out there. Look at the streets around here in, in, in North King Street. Look, look at Smithfield, all, all the, the closely confined streets. Someone's firing a gun at you. You, know, you don't know where they are. Before you figure out where he is, he's repositioned to another position. And, and you, you can't even detect you know, where the original one came from because you've got shots echoing off the walls. 
Now, we separated the various combat zones and battalion areas in the book for a, a number of reasons. One of these is that it would have been, you know, if we're only human, it would have been difficult, if not impossible, for us to inject the level of detail that we wanted and to present the story chronologically. It probably would have come across as quite confusing, but, you know, in, in separating the various battles, you know, we hope that we would allow, you know, any relatives who read the story or, or anyone who just has an interest in any particular section of the story, that they want to follow it through any, any particular arena, be that the South Dublin Union, Boland's Bakery and Mills or whatever. But the most important reason why we separated them was, was because of this. In combat, the soldiers, the men, the women on the ground, they have very, very little idea of what's going on in the overall strategic picture. The same thing applied to the volunteers in Dublin during Easter week. If somebody was in the Citizen Army in Stephen Street, they had no, very, very little, if any, idea what was even going on in Jacobs, or what, certainly what was going on in the South Dublin Union, never mind the four courts. So we felt that it was best to, to that, that was a, a subtle way of getting this point across, was to deal with each garrison area individually. So, how did we set out to do this? We started off with the assault on the magazine fort up in the Phoenix Park there. We then moved on to City Hall, then Northumberland Road and Mount Street Bridge, Stevens Green, South Dublin Union, Jacobs Biscuit Factory, the Four Courts, North King Street where we are today, before finally getting to the most famous engagement of the week, that being the GPO, what was then Sackville Street and the repositioning to Moore Street, I underline repositioning. They didn't go out of that building where, where, you know, with white flags, they had options and they were using those options with great tactical expertise. But in doing this, we pretty much managed to encompass most of, if not all, of the smaller outpost actions that took place related to each other. Yeah. <laughs> we, we like to think that anyway. You know? yeah. now, what we're going to do now is we're going to take you through each individual area now, if that's okay. Everybody with, with so far? The magazine fort in the Phoenix Park. Now, this has been covered in several books about the rising. But it seems to be presented as something of a footnote, given that the assault itself lasted a very, very short time. But what we found fascinating about this was the, you know, it was the lead up to this particular commando raid. Now that's, after all, what it was. It was the first raid of its kind in modern warfare since the commando raids of the Boer War in South Africa, and it was certainly the first of its kind in 20th century Europe. Now, that's quite extraordinary considering that the First World War was, was two years old at this stage. Now, to say that the young Fenia and the volunteers who, who took part, who took up the challenge of, of taking on the fort, had a, an almost impossible task in front of them, take a walk up there and have a look at it. You know, it's a daunting prospect having to you know, storm a position like that. I mean, you know, you, you've got the hill to get up to the thing. Oh, you know, the, any, every acre of land around it was, was cleared of trees centuries ago, so any of its guards would have a very, very clear view of anybody who was trying to, to make an assault on it. But yet, yeah, incredibly, they managed to coordinate their improvisations with astounding skill. They assembled the required amount of men at the last minute, reached their objective, gained entry with a very clever use of trickery and guile, and then stormed the fort at breakneck speed, completely overwhelming its guards. When confronted with the unexpected, they again improvised while keeping the enemy subdued. They then expedited their escape. What followed was an event that added ruthlessness to their arsenal, when, without any hesitation whatsoever, Gary Holohan shot the civilian George Playfair who was trying to raise the alarm. Now perhaps it was lucky for the volunteers that the mission ultimately failed. I mean, a, a similar fort named Fort York was blown up in Canada in 1812. Now when I say they failed, they had planned on you know, blowing up any of the ordnance that was contained within the magazine fort. This was going to create a huge bang. I don't think they realised just how big that bang was going to be. But the bang was going to, you know, to alert all the volunteers in Dublin that, OK lads, the game is on. But like I said, it was probably lucky that they didn't. There was a, a similar fort named Fort York was blown up in Canada in 1812. Um, and if that was anything to go by, well, let's just say, had they succeeded, the southern section of the Phoenix Park would probably look very, very different today, as would Island Bridge and probably, you know, several surrounding square miles. Uh, Paddy, Paddy Daly, Eamon Martin, you know, who had spearheaded it, the Holohan brothers and the rest of their comrades would more than likely not have survived the explosion. When we initially completed the draft of this particular chapter, we sent it to Mick O'Brien, the military advisor. Now, he then showed it to a few of his Defence Forces comrades. Now, they were astounded. I mean, that's actually an understatement to the reaction that we got from them. But what really struck them was the apparent level of the volunteers' training. Now, that would seem fair enough, as you'd expect that 30 or so hand-picked men to carry out, you know, such a, you know, a commando mission would, would have to be very, very highly trained. It would be common sense, it would go without saying. But, 
then bear in mind that most of the originally selected volunteers, they never showed up because of the countermand order. There was such confusion. So they had to scramble men together who knew nothing about the mission until the last minute. Yet apart from the failed super explosion, it went like clockwork and everybody escaped uninjured. Now this strikes me as a very, very far cry from the image I had always been presented with as a schoolboy of a, a brave but foolhardy insurrection, like I said, carried out by poets with pistols and pipes and very, very little or no expertise. This is something that resounds throughout the story of Dublin that week, and these guys were not amateurs. So now we move on to the attack against City Hall and Dublin Castle. Again, I have to refer back to the whole concept of the volunteers and citizen army being, you know, citizen army being so-called amateurs. It's, it's regularly suggested that if the planners of the Rising had any real military skill, they would have you know, planned to take and secure Dublin Castle, the very seat of British rule in Ireland for several hundred, hundred years. Like. But, now this would make sense in theory, of course, but given the forces available, it actually made more sense to them instead to take City Hall. City Hall dominates Dublin Castle. Bearing in mind as well that Jacob's Biscuit Factory, which was in their crosshairs, that overlooked much of the castle's southern section. Had they held City Hall, there's every chance that the castle would have been placed under great strain, and the west to east axis along Dame Street would have been denied to the British forces. Now you think about them having to move all their equipment from the Royal Hospital and West Dublin along Dame Street to get to Trinity College. That, would, that route would have been denied to them, and they would have had to use the keys, and they would have been under fire the whole time. Now, given the amount of men and ammunition that, that were expended by the British forces taking City Hall back from the citizen army, it suggests that had greater numbers been available to the insurgents in that particular case, the positions recapture might actually have been called into question, at least for a much longer period. Now, the fight that was put up by the citizen army, men and women, who took City Hall and its surrounding positions, was it was anything but amateur. Darren is going to expand on that point a bit now. Well, the attack to the British attack, I should say, to retake City Hall began with a softening up with the machine gun sections of the Third Cavalry Reserve. But they uh, they arrived in Dublin from Curra at about 4 p.m. on Monday, the 24th of April. By this point, anyway, we know that uh, the Citizen Army had lost their captain, Sean Connolly, who was shot just after they occupied the position, and Lieutenant uh, John O'Reilly had taken over. The British launched an attack against the Carkill Gate first and then retook that. They needed the gate to be able to get men out to retake this, the hall, basically. This is the one when you're looking at City Hall. If you're looking at Dublin Castle, come up the side of City Hall, Carkill Gate is just on the right hand side as, as you're facing it. I'm going to ask you now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. I was doing well as well. But, like, but once they take the gate and they step outside, they come under a very heavy fire from the Mail and Express and the Henry and James. Now they're both in the corners of Parliament Street. Parliament Street, Street so yes. as they rushed out, they're just met with fire, so they quickly go back in. They now realise they can't go out that way. They're going to have to find another way to take City Hall, so they take to the cellars. And they come down under the cellars from the castle and they come up behind City Hall. So they bypass the gate and they're out a window. Smash the windows, lobbing grenades. They're unseen basically at this point. So uh, John O'Reilly John O'Reilly stands up on the roof, he knows they're down there, he stands up and he gets hit with a machine gun blast. So basically the, the citizen army men have lost, or men and I should say men and women, because there is women in there as well. They've lost both of their leaders. Now Kathleen Lind is it was is it Ipso facto commander of them. Yeah. And um, but the British, they forced their way through the windows, they come piling in, but they are men with like a small, really small, determined force to fight them on the ground floor and that but as more pour in they retreated first to lower landing. So of straight away the British will follow them, but this just becomes a nightmare for them. As they rush up the stairs they are just met with volley after volley after volley of fire. Now their men are getting hit, they're falling down, their comrades are standing on them, slipping on them. So they retreat off the stairs, get the hell out of there. As they come back down, more British soldiers are piling in. They think the ones coming back down the stairs are rebels. They open up on each other. So they have it, and they actually go hand to hand before they realise they're actually the same people. So they pull back and then they uh, regroup. Oh, I think it's the captain regroups them. We don't know his name, we could never find out his name. And they charge in force. And basically they take the first floor landing just by sheer weight of numbers. Basically the ones at the front were being pushed up by the ones at the back. So they take that, they now mop up, they start mopping up City Hall. So they're downstairs, they're, they capture all the, the nurses and everybody. 
in City Hall themselves. When it was being machine gunned, they had to tie the wounded to the pillars so, they, uh, so that you know they wouldn't be flopping around and getting hit by the machine guns. So anyway, they take the, they take the first floor, they're mopping up, they come across uh, Ginny Shanahan. So she's in actually, uh, she's an Irish, she's an army woman, she was uh, in uh, uh, civilian clothes. Mufti. Mufti, yes, Mufti. So they're, they're like, oh, you all right? No, like, what's happened to you? And she's gone, oh, you know, they thought she was a prisoner of the, of the citizen army. So she, she so they call her straight away, they're like, how many of them is there? There's hundreds of them on the roof, and they've got big guns. The British do not like to fight at night time at this them. point. They were not happy about nighttime attacks because they lose communications with each other. So they're all they're like, right. They eventually find out she is a member of the Citizen Army when one of the other Citizen Army waves at her. Yay! <laughs> and so your man's like, but it's too late then. They're like, we'll leave the roof. So they go and then they go straight to Henry and James. Now that's on the down street side of our oh, uh, street. street yeah. so. They rush across there, they take that, they force, uh, it was uh, Sergeant Eli Elliot Elm, Elms, Elms, Elms yeah. out of that position. He, was, he realised, I'm not going to be able to hold this for long, so he pulls back and he goes back to the GPO and reports what's happening. Hen uh, Mail and Express is still holding out. That's so on the opposite corner. There's only five men in, in Mail and Express. Now they might have got one or two reinforcements, can't prove that but can't disprove it either but they would, it would have only been definitely one or two they go so let's say they had seven men in there so the next morning that's the one position that's holding out now got it so next morning dawn no one now that there's no chance of any rebel reinforcements coming from stevens green because stevens green is now under machine gun fire all the ice is the citizen army are caught out in the open they're starting to try and make their way across to uh, the College of Surgeons. So they know not, there's, no, there's no reinforcements going to come and help these. So they know we've got you, basically. So again, they have to go up through the skylights. First, first lot out, get hit. But sheer weight of numbers, that's the only way they can take it. Sheer weight of numbers, get them out of the roof to discover 12 men. That's who held the roof. Now they held the roof for about three quarters of an hour before they were forced to surrender. So then, it would have been a scrap and a half, that it? would have been a scrap and a half. So now the British are actually getting very, very confident because they're like, well, hold on, there's only 12 men up there. We've only caught a couple on the fourth floor of Landwick. You know, we, f we reckon there's only five or six on uh, Henry and James. There can only be five or six in here. So they're getting very confident about this whole thing. But what they don't know is when El Elms gets back to the GPO, he tells Judge James Connolly, Mayland Express is holding out. He then, uh, dawn, just before dawn, he sends, sorry. 27, isn't it 27? 27 Hibernian rifles. Well, minute. there was minute volunteers, Hibernian rifles under Commandant Scott. Oh, okay. Now his orders are, you go up Parliament Street, you take the Exchange Hotel, and if you need to take another position, but don't go any further. The Exchange Hotel, if you're looking at City Hall from the, the Bridge end of Parliament Street. It's about two thirds up on the left hand side. Right. Um, they, they had they had a very clear view of the upper yard in in um, Dublin Castle, where the Dublin Fusiliers assembled in the open to launch several Those, wave attacks. So, like he says, they assemble in the open. They start softening up. It begins at twelve. They're about for two hours. They softened up the Henry and James position, but the fire coming back was just so strong that. Your man, uh, what was his name, Robinson, Robinson started yeah. ordering the machine guns to be put up on the roof of the city on fire down on them. They're firing everything at this position to take it. Because there's, you know, there's just like, let's say, seven bullets constantly coming out, even though they're peppering the place. Don't forget, they're, in, they're NCOs. What are they doing to them? You've got these private soldiers who were told to fix the bayonets to their rifles. When they saw the fire that was coming back at them and what it was doing to their comrades, a lot of them, they dropped their bayonets. They, they, they couldn't hold their hands steady enough to fix them to their rifles. You had NCOs, obviously very, very important in combat, sergeants, corporals, and keeping sections together, the, the, the glue that holds them together. But they're like, well, stick them me, lads, it's only 30 yards. Stick them me, lads, it's only 30 yards. So they launched, they decide it's infantry now, you're going in, basically. Off you go, lads. So the first wave goes out, cut the pieces back in. It's F. O'Neill, isn't it? Second Lieutenant F. O'Neill, yeah, the uh, fifth Dublin Fusiliers. He gets the second wave, they charge out. 
They get forward, they actually get to the wall of the mouse, but they're tight casualties because they don't know about this second position. And neither does Martin Kelly, who, who's, who's in charge in the mouse. So he does not know there's 28 men behind him supporting him. So basically, he thinks he's on his own. So anyway, wave, another wave, another wave, constantly men getting hit as they run across. Another wave, five waves up against the wall, 100 men standing out, sledgehammers, smashing the door in. One of them with the sledgehammers hit from the roof of short holes, which was Scotland's second position, next door to the, to the Exchange Hotel. Smashed their way in. They know the rebels are in the, in the I'll, I'll just call them rebels, okay? Because they know they're on the fourth floor. They know there's no fire coming out of the second floor. I'm um, sorry, the ground floor. They rush straight up the stairs. They are met at the top of the stairs. It's this. It's close. It's fighting. It's, 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 it's this. It's that. Have to have and then we're not lying down. <laughs> so, it takes half an hour before that position is cleared. And then um, they escape. They all escape. They get out of the back. But Seamus Kavanagh, now he was. Um, he was one of the Kimmich garrison and he was in the GPO and for some reason he was out on the tube. Nar kept falling asleep there, right? Not him, not him, a different one. <laughs> and um, that's quite a funny story actually. <laughs> and um, so he's out, I, don't, I couldn't honestly tell you the reason why he's out. I think he was out on his yeah. dispatch. So he's coming along on the keys and he meets one of them from the, uh, the Mail and Express. And your man was just standing in the door, just shocked. Like, and he describes him because dark eyes, like I knew him but I didn't know his name. So he says to him, What are you doing here? And he goes, I've just come out of the men and express. He goes, you know, they forced their way in, they forced us out. We came back and we took it back, but they forced us out again. And he was basically standing like, I don't know what to do. And he's like, get just get yourself back to the GPO. This was a really small, determined force. And that held, like you talk, five men, maybe seven, who held off a hundred soldiers, they just piled in. So then, they've gone, Scotland and his men are still hidden. They kind of have an idea there's more rebels now on Parliament Street. So they send Dublin Fusiliers and the Inniskilling I can never say yeah. that, the Inniskilling Fusiliers down. Scotland and his men just Oh, 23 of them dead and wounded on Parliament on Street. Parliament just, Street. Just, you can just imagine the noise, the booms, the closing facades of all the buildings, and it, it would have been a cacophony. Yeah, been. At that time, they'd sent men into the, onto the roof of Henry and James. Troll hand grenades. Troll hand grenades, and that hits Ned Walsh. From Dominic Street. So, uh, who's telling this one? Me? Ah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, at, at four o'clock, they get orders from Connolly pull out, you've done your job. Basically, because none of our British troops have come down Parliament Street, they're basically standing at the top, just like, we're going to have to clear this building by building by building. And we still don't actually know where this initial group of men is to take. They get pulled out at uh, 4 o'clock, Scotland and his men, they carry Ned Walsh back to the GPO, he later died that night. And the British spotted spot, they're going. And they would let them go. They didn't go after them because they didn't know if there was more positions hidden that it could be part of a plan. The only reason they took City Hall back and those positions was through sheer weight of numbers. Man to man, they didn't have a chance. <coughs> the next <Yeah>. two chapters. <laughs> because I didn't interrupt you. Oh, that's why. <laughs> And I got really nervous and everyone loves someone when they're nervous. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the next two chapters of the book deal with the epic battle of Northumberland Road and Mount Street Bridge, but it also deals they also deal in vivid detail with the often overlooked influence of the surrounding <coughs> positions and how they influenced this particular battle. We mentioned Vice Commandant Joe O'Connor earlier on. Now during the, the battle itself he held the rank of captain of A Company, 3rd Battalion before being promoted later on during the week. The, the positions that he and his men occupied along the railway line from the back of Bowen's Bakery to the level crossing at Lansdowne Road. So, I mean, it was running from, you know, the loop line at Tara Street there, going all the way out to Dunleary, but it, 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 it was, his area of operations was as far as Lansdowne Road, level crossing. Level crossing. Yeah. Now, th these, these were critical, and it's, it's something that we really wanted to, to emphasise here, because, you know, the, the you know, there was a lot of stuff that went on in that area, you know, both leading up to and following the, the very well documented battle of, you know, Mount Street Bridge. Now, this was something that, before we embarked on this, it's, you know, I, I always found this particular battle 
very, very engrossing because I just spent so much of my working life in, in, in that area. Um, but what Darren actually found out during the course of his research was, was that it wasn't just the 13 men who held that stretch of road who, who caused such carnage to the British that, that day. And in that regard, history seems to have been a little unkind to the rest of 3rd Battalion. I mean, the battalion is lauded as having been the last to surrender, but it also gets a hell of a lot of flack for apparently not lifting a finger to help Commander George Reynolds and his six, you know, beleaguered comrades in Clan William House when the position was, you know, starting to catch fire and was in, you know, imminent risk of, of being overrun by a very, very vengeful enemy. Um, again, Darren is going to expand here because no, nothing could be further from the truth. Right, uh, the fight now on Northumberland Road, that's very different from the fight around City Hall. If we think the citizen army positions chosen, they were to contain Dublin Castle, just keep it trapped. Now, then, if you look at the positions that were taken down on Northumberland Road, they're actually really different. There's no barricades. They were chosen to pull the British into them. Yeah? No barricades put across the road. That road was open. So, and they, all these positions, they were, like Clan William House, they were told, don't smash the windows, barricade the windows up. But leave it look like there's no one in the house. Yeah, so they were, they, it was just all very good. Like the one position here, number 25. Like this is the, the plan was, number 25 holds out, gauges the enemy. When they look like they're about to be overrun, they get out the back through Percy Lane. Percy Lane? Percy, Percy, Percy Lane. Lane. They run along, they either do one or two things. They either go into the parochial hall, now which is a few, few houses further back, on Northumberland Road, heading towards Mount Street Bridge, if you don't know. And, um, they would either reinforce that or keep going and go to Clan William House, you know, which dominates the bridge, overlooks the bridge completely. Then, the same thing, the British will come forward, they'll come and like, get a broadside volley from the parochial hall, they'll attack that then. And now, basically, the Clan William House, in there, there's more volunteers, the numbers grow, so the fire coming from there is getting stronger. So, um, let me have a look, because I went right off track there, didn't I? <laughs> right, so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack a tiny bit. So anyway, the British come in from Dunleary, they're marching up. Now, there's uh, Carlsbrook House, which is a little bit further down on uh, Pembroke, 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 There were supposed to be volunteers from the Dunleary uh, company in there. They turned up, there was only about three or four of them. A couple of them took to sniping around the, the area and a couple of them went on to the railway line. Um, basically, what a British soldier shot here, they stormed uh, Carisbrook House, but they kept coming forward, so they're marching up the road. They know, they know the rebels are ahead of them. They've just been told the schoolhouses are occupied. Their orders are, go up there, take the schoolhouse. There's no ambush here. They know, the re they know rebels are ahead of them. They go in in a battle formation. So and as they advance, straight away, number five, Number, number 25 25. opens up carnage in the middle of uh, the junction of Northumberland Road and Haddington Road. Two attempts to outflank, they're just getting cut down. But, and the men who actually do make it to uh, Leeson Street Bridge, back Street Bridge. Oh, so, oh yes, Baggett Street Bridge, come under fire from uh, Bowen, the mills itself. They, the men are there, they've been told, you keep your eye on that bridge, any British soldiers on that bridge, just start shooting them. They had a clear sight from, from, from sight. Boland's, which is on, on the junction of Rings End Road and Barrow Street, um, that they were able to see from, from the elevated vantage point as, as far as actually Leeson Street Bridge. But Leeson Street Bridge, as far as they were concerned, was being, there was a citizen army that were... Yeah. Well, Leeson Street Bridge. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, like I was saying, they, the job, their jobs was pull out, as soon as you were about to be overrun, get out of there, reinforce another position, engage the enemy again. So it's getting stronger every time. Everybody back to Clan William House. They're just drawing them. Oh, come on, come on at us. Because now there's, uh, Clan William House is just opening up on them. So they know now, there, they're right there. But they still have to take the, the schoolhouse. So anyway, they eventually make the schoolhouse. As they go into the schoolhouse, they're under fire. And they go to the schoolhouse, there's no rebels in there. The, dead, the caretaker and his wife are dead on the phone. As they come out through the back of the schoolhouse, they're now under fire from a position over here on the right hand side, which is Robert's yard. So they're taking um, cover behind the, uh, the canal wall. The British attack over the bridge. They charge over the bridge and they just stop dead on the bridge. What they didn't know 
was all along the railway line, the, 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 the railway workshops, the, the towers on top of the railway workshop, there is just rebel riflemen waiting. All guns are trained on the bridge. Basically, Joe O'Connor, as he's running up and down, making them ready, says you can hear the sound of battle getting closer, 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 closer. And then all the men just open up. He knows, he turns, they're on the bridge. They just could not get over that bridge. You've got Joseph O'Bourne's men in the mills now. They're just, just there's, there's an avalanche. The, the, the military, that they call it, the, you've got defilading fire, which is what they were getting from Clan William House, which was in front of them, and it was elevated. The volunteers were covered, they were barricaded in there, that, um, and then you had enfilading fire. This, this was as bad as it could possibly get, where you're getting fire coming from a, from a high position in front of you, and you're also getting from several positions that's coming in on, on, on your flank, and it's just it literally cutting you to pieces. Yeah, so Thomas Walsh, he was a member of the Clan William Garrison, and he, in his statement he says it was great, what is it he says? There's great piles of dead and dying on the bridge. And basically he says they just don't get across the bridge at this point. And this goes on for like about an hour, isn't it? When the fight for the bridge. Long time, yeah. There was also uh, one of the stretcher bearers, Lewis Redmond Howard. Now does the name Redmond come in there to anyone? <laughs> yeah? Do we know who he is? We do. Yes. He is down there watching the battle. There's people watching this battle standing there. And he decides, oh, I've had enough. He, go, he goes into Patrick Dunn's hospital and they give him a stretcher and he's on this stretcher with a man called Highland. That's all we know is the second name, Highland. They carry in 70 dead or dying British soldiers on their one stretcher. They were not the only stretcher party. So now what that says also is there's more British dead than what the British actually say. Because they've been losing men all the way. We know there's at least 20. At the junction of um, as Paddington Road, Paddington Road, Road. Road, yeah, and then it's got this the two two hundred yard, one hundred and fifty yard stretch of road between there and the canal, which was just you're talking. <clears throat> it's it's just, Patrick O'Connor. He was another volunteer. He was going around the city trying to get into a position, but because nobody knew him, they weren't letting him in. They're like, no, you need to get to your own place. He arrives and he just says that the place was literally swimming in blood. This was there. You know, I, basically what I'm saying, this is what I believe, I think he believes this with me as well, that the idea was to get them to the bridge, just do maximum casualties. Draw the enemy in. You, you draw them in, and the, the, the military, sorry, the, 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 no, you don't. <laughs> no, no, you've interrupted <laughs> now. Yeah. Mick O'Brien, oh, yeah, this is great. Oh, yeah, 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 extra entertainment. Here's <laughs> <laughs> the show, show, huh? Don't you? They had, um, what they, they referred to as critical focus. Um, nothing was going to take them away from their objective. They believed that the enemy was in the schoolhouse. That's all they wanted to know. All the evidence to do was to the contrary, but their focus was on the schoolhouse, and they paid the price. They for paid them. the price. It is also said that um, the volunteers uh, on Northumberland Road like uh, held up two British battalions for over eight hours. It's raw. They held up part, best part of the British division for over eight hours. No other troops that are waiting at Dunleary can come forward. Even though, oh, okay, a lot of them are at Paul's Bridge, but they're waiting. Stay where you are till the road's clear. Eight hours they were held. So, so, you, so it's not two battalions, it's nearly a British division. There was at least four or five bata uh, battalions. Four, sure, there's four of the Staffordshire as well. <coughs> yeah, the Leicesters don't arrive till the next morning. Mm -hmm. So you've got the North Staffs, South Staffs. Yeah. But, and there's there's the divisional train and everything there. Basically, it's a division they hold up. So, but it's not just the men in clan. It's also it's the tour battalion hold them up. Because you've got the men on the railway line. They they're part of the battle as well. They, haven't been they don't the get the credit. No, that's it. They don't get the credit they deserve. But it's it's always good because it's it is such a good thing to think thirty. But it's a few more than thirty. But. <laughs> The 13 men do most of the main battle. <laughs> there was a lot of energy. I'm, I'm, I'm balancing that out there. Like. <laughs> no, we, did, we invested a hell of a lot of energy in, in, into the, the chapters dealing with the third battalion. I mean, the, the fighting around Bolands, I mean, it, it might have tapered down, you know, tapered off following the, the Battle of Northumberland Road and Mount Street Bridge. That, that, I mean, about 30 pages in the, in, in the book describing it in unflinching detail. There you go, there's a plug. Um, but there was still plenty going on. I mean, there was bayonet charges, there was vicious sniping for the next few days, there was uh, artillery attacks, or artillery duel, the British against the British. Um, there was shell shock, friendly fire, there was the hatred between the opposing forces. I mean, the determination shown by some of the British soldiers to, to kill the Republicans by any means possible. Um, 
the, trying to trying to shoot a burial party with ricochets. A 23 year old volunteer. He was actually the first volunteer to be killed on in that area on Wednesday, the April 26th, and he wasn't in the immediate area. He was up in Boland in the Loch of Boland's Mill. He was shot through the eye by a, a British sniper. Now they were trying to bury him. But the, the Staffordshire's, who was the staff they, they, they had been, been put, brought in there and it was Friday morning. So they tried to do this kind of an impromptu burial party and the, the Staffordshire's had some inkling of what was going on. They were trying to kill them with ricochets. You know, it's, it's, it's any and every means possible had taken these guys out. That's how, how ferocious it was. Um, you know, there was exhaustion to the point of men suffering hallucinations. You had, you know, the tragedy of killing civilians, you know, particularly uh, Margaret. Neither, you know, um, Stephen's green then. Oh, hold on, can I say something before you go any further? Well, you're not there. No, yeah. <laughs> and, um, even after, you've still got the tour done on the railway line all the way down to Lans Lansdowne Road level crossing. Any junction along Northumberland Road all had to be done at, at the double. Uh, even up till the Friday, they were still losing men. Yeah. Up to the Sunday, I should say, sorry. Yeah. They were still losing men. They came to the junctions, they had to stop. And then they'd blow whistle and loads of them would run across every time they can. And they, in between the junctions, they could march on, have to stop at the junctions, wait, get the whistle, go, like, and get across. There was just rebel rifles trained constantly on the junctions from the railway line. Now, Stevens Green, you know, one of the most beautifully landscaped city centre parks probably in the world. You know, it, it tends to surprise a lot of those who hear about its involvement in the rising. It's, uh, you know, the flower beds, the ornate fountains, lazy open lawns, you know, they seem quite at odds with, with some of the ominous you know, things that went on in there. I mean, for, for Easter week it was, it was a no man's land. Um, it was a witness not only to the horrors of war, but also the surreal, and, and you know, not to mention the ironic. I mean, when it was captured by the Citizen Army under Commandant Michael Mallon on Easter Monday, very little mercy was shown to anybody who attempted to get in the way of the Citizen Army, but equally, there was little or no mercy shown to them when they came under murderous machine gun and rifle fire from the Shelbourne Hotel and the United Services Club uh, for at least three hours early on Tuesday morning. Now, nothing could be more horrific than the death of 16-year-old know, James Fox at that same time. His father had brought him into Liberty Hall uh, on Easter Monday to volunteer his services before, before he left himself, uh, saying he was too old but that his son was prepared to get stuck in. His son died under a hail of Vickers machine gun bullets shortly after dawn broke on Tuesday. Now the horror of war was probably never so impressed on his nearby comrades as when they witnessed what happened to his body afterwards. Every time a shot struck it, whether accidentally or otherwise, the, the, the body jerked and moved, suggesting to the surrounding British rifleman that he was moving or trying to escape. So every time a bullet accidentally hit his body, more bullets were shot at the body. It was torn to pieces. I mean, then we come to the surreal. There's one story about the fight in Stevens Green that always raises an eyebrow and sometimes a sigh of disbelief. Anybody care to have a pop at what it is? Ducks. That's the one. <laughs> quack, quack. From, from Wednesday onwards, you know, both sides ceased fire at least once a day to allow the power keeper, James Carney, to come out and, and do his work. Now, where in the history of warfare, you know, are you, are you going to see something like that going on? I mean, you know, only, only in Dublin, you know. Um, but, but then you've also got a, a blind sniper. Where have you ever heard of, of a blind sniper? Well, again, in the Royal College of Sources in Dublin, there was a young Nathaniel member who was, he was losing his sight due to an eye disease, but he pleaded for so long with his, his comrades, you know, lads, let us shoot your rifle, that they eventually gave in to him. So one of them held his rifle. They, they, <coughs> they sat him up in the rafter. Yeah. They, they cut holes in the roof so he could shoot him. They put the gun, got him ready. And basically, right, that's the where you're shooting. Just straight over there. They wedged the gun so it couldn't move. And they just left them to it. Every time you pull the trigger, we see the same prayers. prayers Hail Mary and, and our father was while, he, while, while, while he was shooting. And then, he, then we come to the ironic. Michael Doherty, he was shot 15, roughly 15 times, uh, probably by a machine gun burst when he was manning the rooftop of the Royal College of Surgeons on, on, on the Tuesday. Now, his rescue was you know, very, very dramatic. Captain Joseph Connolly, he was a fireman, but his brother Sean, uh, was killed on the rooftop of City Hall the, the, the previous day. Now, he, uh, Joseph Connolly completely exposed himself to a very similar hail of bullets to rescue Michael Doherty. So this man with 15 bullet wounds was, you know, lifted fireman style, you know, then manhandled down several staircases through a series of rooms and corridors before finally being tended to while those around him, you know, whispered acts of contrition and, you know, 
played, you know, for for his, for his soul. You know, he's obviously about to die. He's been shot fifteen times, but as well, Frank like, Robin said, "Mick, you're a goner." You're a goner. Ah, oh, Jesus, Mick, you're a goner. Goner, that's, that's it. it. Now the prayers must have worked because by some miracle he survived and died three years later of influenza. Stevens Green. It was also an opportunity for us to explore the role of women as combatants in the, during the rise. And Countess Markiewicz, Margaret Skinner, they, they come to mind as being the most prominent here. Both were ruthless, but the latter, Margaret Skinner, was quite inspiring to those around her. Um, she travelled from Glasgow, taking a, a week off work to go and take part in a rebellion. She like, <laughs> was a school teacher, you know. Um, but she accounted for roughly half a dozen enemy soldiers and personally led an attack on the southern side of St. Stephen's Green. If you look at the southern side of Stephen's Green, about halfway down, there's a very small red brick church. It's the university church now. The British had set up a Lewis gun position in there and it was creating all sorts of havoc. So she set up with, with, with a section to set fire to, I think it was the Russell Hotel on the corner of Harcourt Street. The plan was, you know, once they set up the fire, the fires would eventually spread down and drive the machine gun out of his position. But she was wounded and 17 year old Fred Ryan, he was, he was killed. Uh, by her side, but you know, she got back to the hospital with a couple of bullet wounds, and you know, the, the, the Mercer Hospital, which was an operation that was, that was you know very close to the College of Surgeons, it was you know get down there. They wanted to stretch her down there. She refused. She wanted to stay where she was because she felt that she could you know still be of use to the to the garrison. Now, I mean, the, the women were instrumental in the College of Surgeons in securing um, very very badly needed food supplies. If there was one Achilles heel that the Citizen Army had in the College of Surgeons, it was lack of food. Um, weapons and ammunition were plentiful, particularly later on during the week when they found 80, roughly 80 Lee Enfield rifles in the basement with, I think, 20,000 rounds of ammunition. Which all very, the bayonets as well. Yeah, bayonets. The, the, these were all the ammunition was, was, was put to use, but food was another story. And if it hadn't been for the women, they ventured out time and time again uh, under fire to, to, to get food. But, you know, if it hadn't been for them, the, the garrison probably wouldn't have been able to hold out for as long as they did. But hold out they did. The resistance in the College of Swords was actually so resolute um, and the position so well chosen uh, and subsequently fortified, it actually inspired great respect and ultimately a compliment from the enemy officer who eventually accepted their surrender. Um, Commandant Mallon, who was in charge, I mean, he's often come in for, I think, unfair criticism for his alleged poor choice of positions when he originally captured Stevens Green. Um, he's, you know, frequently accused of tactical naivety when it came to not capturing the, the massive Shelbourne Hotel, it, it dominates the green. But the fact is that he'd originally planned on taking that building, but he was prohibited because of the unexpectedly low turnout because of the countermand order. His own presence of mind and his courage under fire were unquestionable. Yeah. Philip, Philip Clark? Yeah. Oh, well. well, Philip was mown down in front of the Shelbourne Hotel when, when the machine guns opened up at 4 a.m. on Tuesday morning. Uh, there was three citizen army there. They were putting Thomas chains. O Thomas O'Donoghue was in charge. They were wrapping chains to strengthen the, to back strength the, barricade. the barricade. And uh, Thomas O'Donoghue was, was one. It wasn't, Philip Clark was still on the barricade. The other two were walking back. And Thomas O'Donoghue heard a window go up behind him. Top, top floor, and left hand side. up and he's just seen the machine gun tip of it coming out and he's just like no get back in the rain get back yeah, in the rain fired. and the guy who was in the top floor top left hand window blew a whistle the machine gun was on the fourth floor and they opened up and every every window position was, was manned by at least one rifleman so at four o'clock the whistle was blown and you've got mayhem unleashed on the citizen army in St Stephen's Green but, but Malin ran out from the nearby gate uh, under fire, under that sort of fire, to try and rescue Philip Clark. Now he pulled Philip Clark back inside the green, but Philip Clark died there and then of his wounds. But you know, so his, his courage. Was, got a bullet through the hat. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the evacuation from the green into the College of Swords. Bear in mind, the College of Swords wasn't part of their original plans. This was done on the spot. You know, he was able to think clearly on the spot. But you know, this was done. It was a textbook fighting retreat that was done under. Very, very trying, trying circumstances, you know, and, and it was a complete success. There was little, or not, very few casualties when, when, when they, when they evacuated the green and took the college of surgeons. Oh, yeah. I think there was, there was about two or three. Yeah. Yeah. Now, after the green, we bring the reader to the South Dublin Union, which is today St James's Hospital. This was a battle that began on Easter Monday and carried on for the rest of the day at a, at a frenetic pace. You know, before settling down to a series of set pieces and almost continuous sniper engagements. The Volunteers 4th Battalion under Commandant Eamon Kant, they were similarly depleted in number on Easter Monday, but you know, they, they set their tasks, you know, off they went. 
as did their enemies with incredible speed and energy. The, the Royal Irish Regiment based in the nearby Richmond Barracks in, in, in Chicago, they were mobilised pretty much straight away to get into Dublin Castle, sort out Dublin Castle. This, this was the, the order that was, that was reverberating around Dublin as far as the British military were concerned, get into the castle. The fighting in the Union, which was on their way, I mean, that, that, that descended into running battles through hospital wards and corridors, really, really close quarter stuff. I mean, it was very, very traumatic for the, the several thousand residents and the inmates of the Union as well, and, and, and not to mention the staff. But when the Royal Irish Regiment, when they eventually forced entry into the Union ground, suffering, you know, some, some quite serious casualties, the rebels retreated inside the numerous hospital buildings. So the attacking troops quickly found themselves with an unfamiliar maze of various sizes and shaped structures with the echoes of shots bouncing continuously off the enclosing walls and making it pretty much impossible for them to, to pinpoint where the enemy was. When it, the fighting eventually reached inside the building, uh, you know, it, it got really, really nasty and messy where you had listening teams of both volunteers and British soldiers where somebody would put their ear up against a, a wall or a door or a partition and they'd be, they'd be listening to try and hear where the enemy was and they'd be you know, quietly signalling to somebody who's got, got a gun nearby, that's where you want to shoot and they'd be doing that. But both, both sets were doing that. They were taking off their shoes and their boots so that they could, they could, they could move around without being, uh, without, without being detected. Um, there was a very influential outpost, there were several outposts to the South Dublin Union. Can I call in? Of course you can. When they get into the maze of the hospital, when the British advance into the maze of the hospital, the volunteers would be at a window, fire down, run around to another window, they constantly change position. You could have two rebels just moving around the building and it would look to the British like they're under fire from about ten. It was just so clever the way they did it. Now, the most influential of the outposts that was chosen to support the Union was uh, Maribone Lane. Yes, there's, there's no definitely. doubt about that one. This, this, this was, it was a huge structure. It was at the back of the Union. Um, it sat between the, 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 South, the, the Union itself and Maribone Lane. It was pretty close to Cork Street as well. Now, this about four or five stories high, but the, the position held off repeated attacks from, from several directions. Now, the most notable attack was on Thursday morning when it came very close to being overwhelmed until Captain Con Colbert and a section of men launched a decisive counter-attack uh, using a barrage of homemade canister bombs. These canister bombs, they're great stuff, aren't they? They're tin cans filled with jelly knives, nuts, bolts, nails to make shrapnel. They were very, very unreliable, but luckily for the rebels in that particular episode, that they, they worked when they were needed. They, they unhinged the attack, they, they drove it back, but uh, Sean Houston wasn't particularly impressed with the canister Still. bombs, but we'll get to that. Uh, two volunteers were of particular note in Maribone Lane when we were writing the book. There was Robert Holland and uh, Thomas Young. Holland was an exceptional sharpshooter. He was assisted by a uh, Cumann the Mon member named Josie O'Keefe. Now, during the more energetic rifle engagements, he was firing this rifle. Uh, he's got great stories, you know, about this four foot of flame coming out with a Mauser rifle, and he said it kicked like a mule. He must have been quite small. Three foot, he said he got shot. He was back. shot back three foot every, every time he fired, fired that rifle, but that was a single shot rifle. But he'd fire that, he'd give it to Josie O'Keefe, she'd hand him maybe a Lee Enfield, so he'd empty the 10 round magazine of that, then she'd maybe give him, you know. He had three rifles. Three rifles. So, but she, you know, he had to teach her which ammunition. <coughs> He had a sack of ammunition, they emptied it out and he goes, this one's for this gun, this one's for this gun. And she literally had to learn on the spot what, what one went in and she never got it wrong. And, it was and she was lethal. with him all the time under heavy, heavy fire. Yeah, and, and as far as the enemy were concerned, the, the, the pair of them, you know, it was a pretty, you know, uh, you know, a lethal combination. Well, snipers work in teams, don't they? Yeah. So this was an ultimate sniper so she team. She would as well. Yeah, well, she acted as a courier between uh, him Liston. and Liston, who was in the, the crow's nest. She, if, if, he, if Holland spotted somebody, go tell him, tell him where they are. So she'd have to run, and she would basically stick her head up the, out of the, the ladder. The nest built she, she'd she'd be coming under fire. Like. So she'd show up and then she'd run back and start going again. Sorry, Kerry. Oh, yeah. There was also Thomas Young. Now, he was positioned on a footbridge that straddled Marabone Lane that was just outside the distillery. And on his accounts, they were suspenseful and quite hilarious. Oh, at, at that time. <laughs> I mean, when Captain Colbert, uh, he'd originally been in, in the RD Street, <laughs> what, what brewery, but there was nothing happening down there. So uh, he wanted to move his men to uh, Marabone Lane. But what, what he, they sent out for Thomas Young's ma. They go on out and get his ma. The Thomas Young's two brothers were with them in the brewery. So I got a great idea. We'll send out for me ma. Ma, bring down some overcoats. We want to go from here down to there, but we need something to conceal the rifles. So the mother came down and brought a load of overcoats or whatever few overcoats they had. But then she volunteered to lead the patrol as a scout. She went on point. She probably wanted to protect her two sons, but you can...
Oh, she's, yeah, she told them to take oh, their, their the, boots off. The whole lot of them, take all your boots off. Now, there's been a very vicious fight at the previous day in Maribone Lane where the British, in, in, in their, you know, the, the, strategically they were quite clever, tactically they were very, very naive at times. They'd launched a cavalry attack against the Maribone Lane, it didn't, it didn't end well. So, so it, it, but put it this way, you look at Pimlico, the little tightly packed terraces, two up, two down houses, they kind of, you know, snuck through there, and, and, you know, just before dawn. Now, you can only imagine going through an area like that. If they were captured, you know, it wouldn't have been nice, you know, and they would have been probably quite quite aware of that from having heard the battle the previous day. There would have been dogs barking, you know, they would have been, you know, their, their senses would have, would have been tingling for anything that, that was, you know, it wouldn't have been that, that nice, but I'm sure it wasn't nice either for, for Thomas Young, when he saw his mother coming towards the distillery, he's like, what the hell is going on here? So he was on the bridge over, uh, over Marrow Road, Road so from the distillery to the other side. So he got, he got the men around him, okay lads, you know, hang on a second, we've got to cover these guys that are coming through. But eventually, they opened up a wicket gate, you know, the, the mother got in with her two sons, and Con Colbert, and the, the rest of them. But, uh, you know, the, then later on, he introduced us to the lighter side of the rebellion, uh, stealing the Lord Lieutenant's chickens. There was also a little bit of uh, cattle rustling going on in Marrow Lane, but we're not going to spoil it. For no, it. that is really funny, actually. Now, probably the most celebrated engagement of the South Dublin Union was when Vice Commandant Cattle Brewer made his last stand defending the nurses' home. Now, this, this was the 4th Battalion headquarters inside the Union. Um, it, was a, it was a sustained infantry attack on Thursday, April 27th, when the British tried to send ammunition wagons across Rialto Bridge, which is just to the west of the Union. Um, they were trying to get these down to the Royal Hospital in Kilmainham, but they came under quite serious fire from the direction of the nurses' home. So, an attack was launched to overwhelm the position. Now, this was up close and, and as personal as it got because you had this, you know, um, they're going at each other when they, when they got to the nurse's home, throwing grenades and bombs from, from the adjoining rooms and pistols and, and, and whatnot. Now, when things looked like they were actually going in favour of the attackers, which they very, very nearly did, Cahill Brewer, he'd been injured about 25 times, um, at least one bullet, and, and he ran into charging down a staircase directly into a grenade Real blast. blast. You know? now, with this, he somehow managed to keep it together, keep himself in the game, and, and held back a British assault on the barricade. Now, bear in mind, this British assault was so serious that the captain who was leading the assault was decorated for, for putting such energy into the assault. So you had Cattle Brewer there, you know, one man, you know, in, in, in the confusion, the battle, the rest of them had kind of run out of the building, but they, they had started to come back. But he was there. Just as the pendulum was starting to swing back in favour of the volunteers, Brewer was, he was instrumental. He started shouting at an imaginary force. You ten men come with me, you ten men go over there. The British are thinking, oh Christ, there's bloody more of them. And then he's singing God Save Ireland at the top of his voice. Now, if that was a, a, a normal sort of a military engagement, I mean, if that had happened in the British Army, um, he would have been awarded the Victoria Cross because one, that's the highest thing you can get. Or in the US, it's the Medal of Honour. And part of the, the criteria for winning the highest award you can get is that, you, is that your actions sway, they, they swing the balance, which is what he did. Now, you know, this completely bewildered the, the, the British soldiers who were trying to win there. But the fight that was put up by 4th Battalion throughout the South Dublin Union, it was praised even by the enemies following the rise. I mean, the, the number of graves being dug in, in the open ground, there was a mass grave dug just to the southwestern Rialto. I mean, that's a testament to just how brutal and serious the, the fight fighting was. But now, then we get to Jacob's Biscuit Factory, your favourite place. My favourite place. Oh, Hunga. <laughs> Well, the, the, uh, the men of the 2nd Battalion, Irish Volunteers, they, uh, they occupied Jacobs. But they were mostly like from, from Condra, Clontarf, Marino, uh, the sort of fair northeast of the city. And uh, they were mobilised in those areas and they were told, get yourselves over to Stephen's Green. That's the that's, uh, muster point. So uh, the fighting yeah, in itself in and around the factory, like once it's secured, this was like more long range. And it was like uh, psychological rather than uh, than, uh, than like in the like like in the South Dublin Union where if they were up sort of full, full, on, full yeah. on, yeah. You know they had uh, an attack against them on Monday, but that was um, a force of the Royal Irish Rifles. It was, yeah, the Royal Irish Rifles who were chasing a citizen army unit out of Davies Pub, which overlooked Port Bello uh, Bridge, and uh, they were following them up, and they came up and. Um, they came under fire from Jacobs, so they lost a few men, they were treated. The next day, the same thing happened, but with a much larger force. I don't know why the ones on the Monday never told the ones on the Tuesday, don't go, don't go there. 
seriously, like, don't go that way. They marched up the same road. I came under fire from the same position. They retreated and realised that's just not going to happen. That's not a good idea. It's not going to happen. There's no way in. It's a massive structure. Well, it, it was a massive structure. So, um, you know, the, the, the troops are all, like he was saying earlier on, they're all trying to get to uh, Dublin Castle. So they decide, right, we're going to uh, bypass that position, we'll just leave it as it is. And then it becomes long range then, you know, there's the two towers in um, Jacobs. Huge, huge towers. There's men on top of these towers. And uh, it's Michael Malloy, isn't it? He was the composite. Yeah, yeah. He goes up onto the, onto the towers. He, for some reason, he's sent up there. So anyway, he goes up and they're literally just ch -ch -ch down onto Portobello Bridge. Now, they've all got the elf Enfields, yeah, they've got something that they can use fast. And he's like looking at them, looking down onto Port, but he's using binoculars. Like, how he is hitting it? Because we're basically what we do is we wait. Because see them guards, there's guards. Every time they turn, the belt buckles glints and the bayonet glints, we just shoot in between. So there. <laughs> but it's exactly the way he it's describes it. Like, so he it's just it's watches and is just amazed at what they They actually stopped using the binoculars to look. They just they, in the end that that's kind of stops because any British soldier that stepped onto Portobello Bridge was just being shot. They all it was another thing. It was really hard to come out of Portobello. Every they had to sprint across the bridge. It was it was just impossible. To put. If, as soon as they stepped on it, they were shot. Uh, the psychological then, the British then decided, right, like we said, we're going to contain them, we're not going to attack them at the moment. What they decided was, we'll deal with the other areas first, we'll come back to you. So we haven't forgot you, we're coming back for you. And so what they did is they then employed psychological. So they get, start getting armoured cars or armoured vehicles, and they drive around them and they just keep revving the engines. So what the idea is, try and keep the, the, them awake. But this really only happened, uh, works on the ones that are on the outside. So, yeah, like on Century Julie, so they're at the man in the position. Anyone in the centre is not really hearing this as much. But it does have its effect on them. They, they're quite angry that the British aren't attacking them. They want them to attack them. Um, hold on. Hold on. Uh, yeah, but also what Jacob showed us was the difference in feelings from civilians mm. uh, towards what was happening. And, um, volunteers, they had an awful time with the outpost, outpost I can't say this, I'm going to... Malpass. Malpass Street. Fumbly. Fumbly. Yeah. I know how to say Fumbly, it's Ma I keep saying Mapless. <laughs> I keep on the P the wrong way around. And uh, as they were, they, these were two levels, they were to, if part of works, and men come out, they were going to stop them as well if they came up there. There was another bank as well. Wellington, yeah. It's today, yeah, Griffin College. So anyway, they, um, the crowd came after them here. They grew in numbers. They did have to shoot a couple. But they ran and mucked. The they, they civilians ran, went ran at them. Muck, and they Trouble. followed them. Yeah. And that's the thing. When they were being pulled back to Jacobs, they came after them. And they the were getting assault. angrier. The yeah, the yeah. Civilians. And, but at the same time, what you get is, during all this, when they are in Mao Pass Street, uh, this old woman pushes her way and kicks her way through the crowd with two buckets of teas for the volunteers. So, it, you know, she's not compelled at all, like, ah, oh, oh. next thing she goes up and hands two buckets of tea over the barricade. So you get a mixture of what, how people, but what do you have to remember, in that area anyway, there was a lot of uh, dependents' wives. Yeah. So their husbands are off. They're, they've signed up for the duration of the war. They're getting money for their husbands away. So you can see the why they're angry, but it, it's good because it shows you how some civilians uh, acted towards them. Yeah. But even saying that, you know, when um, when Jacob surrenders, they were getting pulled as they marched out. They were being pulled out, and I'll hide you. I'll hide you. Some hid. Um, Vinnie Bourne. Vinnie Bourne. Vinnie Bourne, the famous Vinnie Bourne, he was dragged out and he kicked up a stink hit. There's another guy with him. He didn't want to be dragged out, but she got him in the house. That she washed, because they're all white, they're covered in flour. And um, so she got him, they got the two of them in the house. She made, she wiped them all down. She made them sure they're clean. I think she gave them overcoats. She made sure that the air was clear and then she let them go. Now, the only, the thing about Jacobs on Sunday the 30th, there was, it was being brought together to attack the position. 
if they didn't surrender, it was going to be relays. This was not going to just be an infantry attack. There was four battalions, for, sorry, four brigades of artillery had landed in Dublin in their general pale on the Friday night. One of these were howitzers, big siege guns. They were just going to flatten the whole area. They were evacuating the civilians. There's the uh, Mercy Art Hospital that was being emptied. For and this is what they, they knew something was coming. But they were ready for it. They had like barbed wire all over the, the, the openings or anywhere. They had sandbag and placements made of bags of flour. Every inch of Jacobs was going to be fought by the volunteers. David would not be a walkover for the British to take Jacobs. They would have had to employ the artillery. It would be the only way an infantry attack would have been beaten back time and time and time again. And I think Jacobs get it. They always, I always heard, sure, just some of them went home for the Cayley. No, they didn't. <laughs> they lived from the north side. That's a long, long way to go home for the Cayley. <laughs> and how are you going to get past the GPO without getting shot? Yeah. You know, they get a hard time when they should. If you look into them, you'll see that they prepared themselves well. It was going to be every inch. But, but having said that, you know, you look at what, what four artillery pieces did to what was then Sackville Street and Moore Street, and, and that, that surrounds the area. That was four 18 pounders. On the Friday, they landed roughly 40. This is what, they were, this is what they were lining up to, to, they to were go at. In Dunn Leary, they were ready to come in. They, they, they didn't have to use them in the end, they were sent up. We got uh, General Peel's um, notebook. Like he, what he is, I suppose, his little, his little uh, book, and he wrote, we are not needed because by the Friday night, they, the low thinks he's got it all under control, so we're kept at Dunleary, and then they're eventually moved to Finsbury. Jacob's been one of the choir garrison areas, it gave us an opportunity as well to explore in more depth the mindset of the volunteers, uh, particularly through the, the endearing memoirs of volunteer Joseph de Bruyne. Um, he'd been on his way to the seaside on Easter Monday, lovely day, and when he heard of the, the mobilisation, but he quickly made his way to his battalion. But some of his recollections were, were hilarious. I mean, just, you know, it's, it's when, when he sees it, he goes, That looks like a mobilisation to me. <laughs> and then he goes, Oh, this is, he is so funny. But the first night he couldn't sleep, he, you know, he was sent in to, to, to you know, get a couple of hours' clip on, on, on the ground, but somebody near him had suggested that enemy artillery might blow up the huge chimney towers and bring them crashing down around them. So, you know, his thoughts regarding captured policemen were particularly telling. I mean, there was little love lost between the volunteers and the Dublin Metropolitan Police. I mean, but then his account of being on guard duty overnight, having little or no sleep for, for, for days on end, are, they're a perfect example of the psychological aspect of the engagements of Jeff Jacobs and, and, and everywhere else. Um, but particularly, as, as Darren said, you know, Jacobs was very, very sort of a, a psychological thing. Now, this there seems to have been, as Darren said, very little overall coverage of Jacobs just in, in writings, and this is something that we wanted to kind of you know, do, do our little bit to kind of put to rights. At this point in the book, we cross over the River Liffey to um, we turn our attention to the fighting that involved Commandant Edward Daly's first battalion. Um, Irish volunteers. Now this area encompassed in chapters 8 and 9 of the book, they deal with the, it stretches from Usher's Quay up as far as Glass Nevin Cemetery, that's where the fighting was going on. Um, the fight that took place in and around what's today the Dublin 7 area was more than likely the worst street fighting yet seen by a, a modern army anywhere in the world. North King Street and the surrounding warren of narrow streets it represented an almost perfect defensive zone that was it was exploited with considerable skill by Commandant Daly. Uh, Darren will get to that in a little while. But from Easter Monday all the way through to Saturday morning, there was mayhem in this area. With pandemonium, there was, there was almost a continuous sequence of set piece engagements that grew in ferocity and viciousness as the week progressed. Initially, there was a secure of the forecourts, followed by the routing of the, the lancers. Um, then we had the engagement of Captain Sean Houston's small section of volunteers for the first time, their, their first volley killing an enemy officer of the Dublin Fusiliers whose brother was fighting for the volunteers in the forecourts. Such were the ironies of Dublin at the time. But the Fusiliers had been scrambled together hastily in what is now Collins Barracks and were being rushed to the relief of Dublin Castle. It was when they crossed the river at Queen Street Bridge that, that Houston realised, as we mentioned earlier, his supply of canister bombs were, you know, they, they were about as useful as rocks. One of them um, says that, doesn't he? Yeah. At least I'll knock him out with it. They wouldn't like it. But Houston and his men really kind of stood out two days later during the late morning and early afternoon of April 26th, which was Wednesday, while all this stuff was kicking off around uh, Mount Street Bridge. Now, now, his position now held 26 men and came under a sustained attack from over 300 Dublin Fusiliers. The fighting was, uh, I'd say intense, but you could probably say insane would probably be a little bit better. Um, Houston's men held off several, I mean, desperate attacks 
preceded by heavy machine gun fire, followed by a barrage of hand grenades, several of which were picked up by the volunteers and thrown back at the attackers. It was street fighting at its most desperate. Now we had modern er Okay, With modern artillery being used in, in, for the first time in anger, um, you know, when, when two 18-pounders were used to attack a rebel barricade straddling the North Circular Road near St. Peter's Church up there towards Cabra, Broadstone Railway Terminus was assaulted shortly afterwards. The Linen Hall Barracks down the road in Cold Rain Street, that was set on fire, resulting in an inferno that could be seen for miles, miles away. And, and at night, you had the sky lit up by that, but you had you know, British flares getting sent up you know, every few minutes or whatever. It was, this place was an out-and-out -out war zone. As well as you had numerous small scale attacks around the four courts, there was, there was constant sniper fire both from the north of here and from the far side of the, of the river. It was incessant. Now, the strategic value of this area was huge. It defended the city from the volunteers' point of view from an attack from its west and its northwest. The retention of this area would also facilitate a breakout into the countryside around Glass, Nevin, and Finglas in the event of the volunteer army becoming overwhelmed in the, in the capital. They'd make their way out fighting us around the countryside. Uh, the 5th Battalion was already out there, they'd link up with them. But its strategic importance was not wasted on the overall British military commander, General Lowe. Um, on Thursday, April 27th, he, he ordered an attack from the south of the river, the river uh, across Capel Street Bridge, with the objective of securing Capel Street itself. This would split the garrisons between the Four Courts and the GPO. I've heard it said that the British Army's field manual on urban street fighting was written on the streets of Dublin during the Easter week 1916. I mentioned earlier that the Irish Defence Forces, they have their uh, phibia, but the British use the term fish, which is fighting in someone's house. Now I would argue that this good proof of how they were forced to, to write that manual very, very quickly in Dublin was, was their capture of Capel Street Bridge. They used improvised armoured cars to ferry men across and, and kind of leapfrogging and, and, and realise they suffered some casualties doing that but a hell of a lot less than they had suffered the previous day crossing Mount Street Bridge which was half the length and half the width but they, they had a lot less casualties on Capel Street but it was following this that the South Staffordshire's were introduced to the area on Friday and this is where Darren comes together. Right, so we're, we're going to we'll talk about North King Street area. That's North Brunswick Street, North King Street. Uh, well, I'll read out the positions to you. There was the Malt House Tower, which is on Barrister Street. I don't know which one. I'll do the point. Yeah, you do the point. Yeah, the Air Hostess. The Air Hostess. It's going to get bumpy anyway. So the you roof of the Bride Mill, I know that's down there, at the back of the park. actually down there. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's up there. Yes, yeah, sorry. sorry. Uh, <laughs> right, okay. Um, you point. Back to the park, Langan's on the corner of Coleraine Street. Hey, <laughs> yeah, on Upper Church Street, Monk's Bakery, which sat in between Upper Church Street, Coleraine Street, and also overlooked North King Street. Then you have two positions on opposite corners of North Brunswick Street, where it meets Upper Church Street. And there's like men at the barricade at, outside Father Matthew Hall, half built cottages on Stirrups Lane. And these, these can cover either Beresford Street and Church Street. And then you have uh, Red Cow Lane. It's there, that's it. Okay. Hey. And that, um, you have it, uh, the dispensary and tenements on either side. Barricades go up straight away. This place is really going to be a war zone. Basically what they do is they ha not really much happens to them at the start of the week. They have the Lancers, things like that. They, go, they do an attack up to Broadstone to see if it's occupied. It is. It's melding on the 4th Dublin Fusiliers. They come back down. But all the time this is going on, the barricades are getting stronger, stronger, stronger. These vary in height. I have read that some of them are 18 foot high. But these are serious barricades. Now, get to the main point. Two sixths south staffs come in under Lieutenant Colonel Henry Taylor, attacking from Bolton Street. And they're linking up with the two fifth who are attacking from Queen Steve nice one, you know, and, and, and Smithit. Yay. Yay! Right, now it takes them twenty-four hours then the south the two six to take a quarter of a mile around. Right? And the reason for this is once they're in uh, North King Street, they're just surrounded by volunteer positions and they're just getting shot and barricades pulled up, they can't move any forward. The barricades were so strong that they bring in an armoured car to ferry men in. He can't get past, he can't even push through, it has to pull up beside it, and that's outside the mountains. And then, but I've always looked at thinking, yes, that's brilliant, like that's so well planned out. And then I thought, well, what happens if the British didn't attack along North King Street? Well, the whole thing just works in reverse. Everything is beautiful. Everything, no matter what way you attack that position, that junction, it works in reverse. I'll give you an example. Now, I'm going to read these because it is hard to remember, okay? 
Right, so, so this is a little, little, little uh, Lord King Street. Right, let's say they attack from Broadstone, yeah? So they're coming down the hill straight away, the, uh, the Malt House Tower is firing at them, the Roof of Clarks, Moors, they're all firing at them. They're the ones on uh, North Brunswick Street. Malt House, as I said. Um, the, the firepower will be quickly added by Riley's and Monk's Bakery. And if they, then if they decide, right, we're under heavy fire here, cut down Colerain Street, Monks now, which is in the middle, is shooting into the sides as they come along. Mm -hmm. Moors, Clarks and Langdons now fire into them. Now let's put, bring them along North Bruns, Brunswick Street, straight away, barricades, dispensary, tenement houses overlooking Red, Red Cow Lane, then Moors and Clarks. They just can't go anywhere. Then, and if they get past them, Monks, Rileys. Everywhere. The and then of course towers. the river was covered as well. The towers the just, the barricade, yeah. Right. No matter what way they attacked, it exactly the same. Once they jumped the barricade, they would find themselves faced with more barricades there. This cut off escape routes. It got them into squares and that three or four volunteer positions just fired down, down, down. They were screwed as soon as they, for want of a better word. But as soon as they the got over the barricade, the it. that was it for them. That's why they, they you start to use rebel, rebel tactics, go into houses to launch attacks. This is where you get the North King Street Massacre. Because they get into the house, they're angry. They, they're, he's lost control of them. They've also been given the order. Lieutenant Colonel Taylor was given the order. Anyone in a rebel held area is fair game. They, they put up proclamations to say all, all civilians have to leave these rebel held areas. This, is a, this was a rebel held area. British soldier was coming in there. I've just got to put this up here. Oh, Chase Chef, by the way, like. Do you know what I mean? They're not going to let him come in to post the proclamation. So the people in the area didn't know that they were just justified targets in the eyes of the British High Command. But this, I mean, this area here has often been referred to since as Ireland's mini Stalingrad. That's, that's the, the level, the, the viciousness, and just the, the, the trauma that it suffered. And plus the way that the streets gave. Now we then move on to the most well known of the, the week's engagements, those being the events around the GPO and Sackville Street and the subsequent repositioning of the headquarters garrison to Moore Street. Now, in spite of having been played out time and time again in numerous books, we found, we, we went on to, to get to this particular, to, we found it mesmerising, the, the, the stories, the, 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 there's so many and each one is as, as compelling as the, as the next in its, in its own way, I mean, particularly when we get towards the end of the week, but as a military set piece, yeah, again, this, this is something that, that goes against uh, common misconceptions about their tactical abilities. Um, the occupation by you know, it, it was it was pretty much you know done according to the textbook. They, they they took their position, they secured it, they expanded its defensive perimeter, and then made a point of defending that with as much tenacity as they could. Uh, pretty, pretty standard militarily, you know. There wasn't a lot wrong with what they chose to do, given what they had, particularly. Now, I've heard you know considerable criticism over the years, you know, you know, about that that whole thing, the positions that they took, you know, that they should have taken Trinity College. They couldn't, they didn't have the numbers, the guns didn't land and carry. That's you know that's not what we deal with in the book. We do what we say on the team. We're dealing with close quarter combat, you know. Um, but I think it's important part to point out that, you know, these men and women they, they were very the very opposite of tactically naive amateurs. You know, they, they weren't. And I think it's very, very unfair for commentators to suggest that they were and there's plenty who line up to do. Um, the way they conducted themselves in Sackville Street and afterwards, I mean, it was eons away from, from you know, what I learned about in school, or I mentioned that earlier on, but, you know, we were told very little of the shattering, compelling stories of, of you know, the fighting spirit displayed against, you know, practically impossible odds of rebels refusing to abandon positions until their uniforms were catching fire. You know, the desperate struggle in the back lanes of Moore Street, you know, we'll come back to that, but the, the point is that their, their deployment and their defence of their headquarters was, you know, more or less textbook, you know, and quite well thought out. I mean, the fact that they could only be driven from the field by vastly superior numbers, backed up by artillery, who were firing from out-of-sight positions, you know, that's proof of that, you know, and even then, when they were set against that, they were far from being out of options, they still had moves that they, they could make and they intended making them. But you're probably all familiar with the story of the you know, storming of the GPO on Monday, Pierce, you know, broadcasting the proclamation outside. We're going to take you now on a little journey into what happened afterwards, so you know, bear with us, we're getting, we're getting done. 
you know, initially there was the Lancers attack which was driven back, you know, there being the first time in action for a lot of the volunteers, you can imagine how they felt at this time, you know, there would have been a daunting prospect to them, you know, a lot of them, you know, they, they fired too quick, you know, the Conley ordered them to hold their fire until these Lancers were directly in front of the GPO and they could have wiped them out but they didn't, they shot them way too early and, and a lot of them escaped. Um, what follows takes up the best three chapters of the book, and that's before we get to the surrenders. But Monday saw the operation of the world's first ever pirate radio station, another first that happened that week in Dublin. Um, you know, it saw the first ever deployment of the armoured car on Wednesday. You know, quite a few, you know, um, firsts. As the insurgents consolidated their positions, they occupied, uh, you know, uh, buildings overlooking O'Connell Bridge, the huge Dublin Bread Company. Uh, this was on the eastern side of the street at its southern end and it gave them a, a, you know, advantage over the entire area and this would be pivotal in dealing with the British sniping from the far side of the river. Incidentally, a lot of those snipers were Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders. They would have been, a lot of them were, were recovering from wounds from, from France or wherever and they'd been recuperating in Dublin. A lot of them were on leave. Dublin was a great place to, to come and chase the Colleen's around St Stephen's Green. You know, it was a very pretty city, you know, the second city in the empire. A lot of them liked being here but these guys couldn't wait to get stuck in. There was a, a local journalist described them as men whose expressions would betray them. What was it again? They were fashioned for the enjoyment of danger. Um, something Trin something like Trinity College was like a, a beacon to these units and uh, you know they were very very eager to get stuck in. The Kelly's Fort, uh, the name given to the fishing tackle shop on Bachelor's Walk, Darren likes this because he reckons it was well, named after him. <laughs> But the man, the man who really say fired the first shots of the Eastern Rising in, in Fulham or the previous St. Patrick's Day, uh, Pat O'Bracken, another day's work, but uh, yeah. several others had the position, but they were driven out by artillery and very, very heavy machine gun fire on the Wednesday. The looting that took place on Monday night was, was rampant and well documented, but it's been said that Cleary's department store it looked like an anthill, the amount of people that were trying to scramble in, in and out of it. Then we had a fireworks shop going up in flames, and that would have been fun. But we were really trying to imagine what, 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 O'Connell Street, Sackville Street was like in that first night. It was very hard to kind of put your head there, you know. Um, you had a sunny bank holiday that morning, you know, and then suddenly this revolution, a free for all, probably enormous sense of disturbance and, and no doubt fear of what was inevitably come. Tuesday was fairly quiet in the Sackville Street area, considering what was to come. The expansion of the rebel positions uh, mentioned earlier continued in the form of the occupation of the Metropole Hotel, just if you're looking out with the GPO to the right, and then we had the Imperial Hotel, which was above Cleary's opposite. So you know, then they, they started uh, burrowing into the buildings as, as far as uh, back into Henry Street, as far as Liffey Street. Wednesday was something of a comedy of errors for the encircling British forces. After subjecting Sackville Street to several nine yard belts of machine gun ammunition, they, they, they held it opened up with a nine pound deck gun. Now her sights fell upon Liberty Hall, the, the building which had spawned the insurrection that she had been summoned to crush. So the building had been fortified uh, to appear that it was occupied and forced, but it had actually been abandoned. Now th this was followed by two 18 pounder artillery pieces opening up, but in doing so, from the entire street, but they, they nearly killed their own crews, never mind what they did to the enemy, uh, because they couldn't be dug in, so they spun like ice skaters and nearly took off the legs of the troops who were, or the artillerymen who were trying, trying to fi fire them. Uh, the same thing happened the following day in Sackville Street when another 18 pounder gun it, it, it spun out and fired a shell into the YMCA on Upper Sackville Street, the street which was occupied by British forces who thought they were under attack. Ran out. They ran out. <laughs> but back to Liberty Hall, as soon as the hell had finished plaster in the place, a bayonet charge was launched by the recently arrived Ulster Composite Battalion, hugely motivated. They stormed in only to find the place devoid of the enemy, much to their amusement. Now the composite battalion had been scrambled together on Easter Monday up in Northern Ireland but on, on Thursday they suffered no such amusement. They weren't disappointed on Thursday when they made contact with the enemy and it, it didn't end well for them, they were, they were decimated. Wednesday evening for the volunteers was a bit like when the accordion had reached the end of its expansive range and from there there's only one way things are going to go. The artillery was beginning to close in and the entire length of Sackville Street it whistled at that, that stage to 0 0.303 bullets but it still wasn't without its small victories for the Republicans. I mean when the first armoured car appeared lumbering down Sackville Street there was panic among the rebels for a time until the volunteer Joseph Sweeney took out the driver with a well aimed shot. Um, it saw no use in this, uh, no further use in this particular battle. Thursday was when the noose began to tighten properly. This was when the artillery began to zero in. But again, bear in mind that it was still by no means a one-way contest. Frank Thornton's men in the Imperial Hotel managed to take out at least one artillery crew with long-range rifle fire, and then, as we said earlier, when the Ulster Composite Battalion attacked across the junction of Abbey Street and Sackville Street, they came under a vicious hail of fire, and the subsequent exchanges of fire became so serious that the volunteers in Mansfield's boot shop 
had to stop shooting as the rifles became too hot. They used the oil from sardine cans. They didn't like the taste of them, so they stacked them all up, everything else they had. So on Thursday they had loads of sardine cans. They put them to use cool in their homes, then rejoined the fight. Now, we mentioned Cable Street becoming occupied by the Sherwood Foresters earlier on. Um, this is indirectly what led to James Connolly's two, two gunshot wounds. When, we heard, when he heard that his western flank was now occupied, he ventured out to supervise the occupation of buildings and the construction of, of a couple of barricades. Now, he received a horrific wound, the second wound, just above his ankle. But having been operated on and a couple of hours rest, he insisted on, on still on, on leading his garrison. I mean, he, he was loved and admired by, by the men for this, this fortitude that he displayed throughout that week. But it's, it's difficult for us today to imagine the pandemonium of Sackville Street on Thursday night. Hoyt's Oil Works, which had been used as a field hospital by Cullen the Mon, it was, it was next to Cleary's and the Imperial Hotel in the direction of... O'Connell Bridge with a small gap between the buildings but it caught fire now it was filled with everything from from turpentine paraffin exotic spices if it burned it was in there the place went up like a blast furnace and it spewed out scores dozens of barrels which exploded while airborne it saturated the surrounding buildings with flames the Imperial Hotel just adjacent that soon went up now at this time the entire southeastern section of Sackville Street was in flames the glass from the windows in Cleary's department store was flowing in the street like lava with the heat. But the rebels inside were still firing, literally until their uniforms caught fire. Now the entire block it collapsed at 3 a.m. on Friday. The GPO was next to Donald Trump and say a bit more here. Okay. Um, so on Dawn Friday, British soldiers they start crossing uh, O'Connell Bridge. They're, in, they're coming across in small numbers. From Cable Street, now you've got small problems being said. They're testing, the British are testing what's ahead of us. They don't know. They've got a clue what they're facing, really. Every time they've attacked, they've been beaten back. So you'll have soldiers filtering up Lower Abbey, Abbey Street into Marlborough Street, find a place. No four shells come flying over and hit the roof of the GPO. The breeze picks up, and then the fires from the Metropole jump across. This is how the GPO roofs get, gets caught for. The shells that are coming in are actually uh, shrapnel shells. Uh, the, the, well, the high, like the high explosives, there's not the, as the, many as what everyone yeah. thinks. Right, the coming of man, apart from the nurses, they're ordered out. Uh, this is just after that because they realise this is starting to go up now. The, the fire's jumping. And uh, they kept, they moved up uh, Moore Street and surrendered at the British Barricade at the top of uh, Moore Street. Officer in charge looks at them and, as you said earlier, like, what the hell are you doing here? Women, like, like, what, 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 go on home. Why is there women in this army? Go home, just keep going. Dublin Fusilier stops them up at Broadstow, he's are all under arrest. You know, <laughs> looks like the Dubliners knew, yeah, it's alright for women to fight, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, um... They've been married. Yeah, yeah, they, they probably, you probably knew each other, you're right. But yeah, then at 3pm, a, a shell smashed into the telegraph office on the roof of the GPO. This causes an explosion. This is the nail in the roof of in the nail of the GPO. This is it now. Whatever this shells hit, it's just massive fire has started. Uh, 6 p.m. It's, it's things are just going wrong down below. You know the wounded nurses are evacuated to Jervis Street. Uh, just as they are leaving, the southern section of the roof collapses in around. Uh, they've decided now, right? This is it. We need to get out of here. They we can't hold this position anymore. Like it's it's just. It's no good, basically. The roofs are collapsing. Uh, you know, we need to get out of here, basically. So they pick a building called Williams and Woods, which is, you put down, it's... It's the IMAX, IMAX cinema. cinema. It was the Virgin Cinema. It's right there on the corner. So, um, it was big enough. It would hold, there's about 350 men here now. And you've got, now all the women, there's only about four women left. Three yeah. or four women left. Like, um, three. So, three, straight, there you go. So, um, that's it, they're pulling out. They basically, they send ahead uh, O'Rahilly with, with a 30 man a squad. Their job was to go through, fight, they knew there was going to be British soldiers there, so they're going to fight through, hold the way over, occupy the building itself, then the main force follows. Well, the reason why they're going to do this, the reason why they picked this building as well in particular is, they know they're going to cut through the British lines. So that means it gives the British two options. Shite, the rebels are here now amongst us. We have two options, we either attack them with infantry or we pull everyone back 
realign the artillery so we can take this building off. By that point, the rebels have pulled out that building, they're now on the four courts. It's so now, so they're not now you're looking at about 600 men prepared to fight. In these streets? In these streets. Given the bloody nails that they had with still the still what's up here. So, right. So, a rally leads to the assault as we know. About seven torpedoes charged up Moore Street towards the British barricade, and then it's just mayhem. Yes, you were there, you know? Yeah, uh, you know, at about 7, 7.30, he, he and his men left the GPO and charged up Moore Street towards the British barricade, where they, they literally launched themselves into the teeth of enemy machine guns. And then the evacuation of the, the GPO really began proper at that stage. Now, in, in spite of the growing chaos, it was quite well organised, with, with three men crossing Henry Street at a time, most of them carrying supplies, and all the while under machine gun and rifle fire. Captain Liam Tannum had been sent across to initially secure Henry Place. When he did, he signals Patrick Potter Pierce uh, each time three men made it across. Sword goes down, three men move across. Then he said three more. And Sword so goes on. back up. Captain Sean McLaughlin, a 20 year old who had been put in a position in, uh, and, and over, on top of the printing office of the Irish which Independence. Is now, which is a bit further along. Than he had seen what O'Reilly and his men were getting themselves into because he was up so high. He knew how many British soldiers were in that area. He rushed out after them to try and stop it. He went into Moore Lane. All he saw was there were about 10 men at the junction of Moore Street looking bewildered and leaderless. He asked him where the O'Reilly was. He said he's gone. But McLaughlin, um, he detailed those 10 men to, to form a sort of a cordon. He knew what was going to be coming. There was about 300, 350 going to be following him into that very confined space, but he didn't want them rushing blindly on into Moore Street and into, into the machine guns themselves. So when Henry Place filled up and the volunteers tried to cross Moore Lane, which intersected Henry Place, this is when things really started to go wrong for them. The machine gun, there was a, I think it was a Lewis gun up in the rotunda, had a clear view along the same length of lane, and that just, just emptied magazine after magazine, streams of fire at the volunteers who, who were exposed while they were trying to dart across the dish, but maybe 10, 12 foot wide. Um, but the, build, the building that faced Moore Lane was, was the White House, now this was under so much fire, if you, can only, if you can imagine a building being under so much fire that to those nearby it actually appears that the fire was coming from the building itself. So they organised a party to storm into this, that was led by Michael Collins. They found out that it was empty and they eventually started, they, they made it their job then to return fire to try and suppress the, the machine gunner in the rotunda. So at the same time, this is where Sean McLaughlin really you know, stood up to the plate at this point. He took control of the situation. Um, his actions here and elsewhere during the week would actually result in him being made Commandant General of the, the Moore Street Volunteers. He ordered men to break into Cogan's shop, which was the building on the northern corner of Moore Street and Henry Place. He then organised a barricade across Moor Lane, so that the volunteers could cross in relative safety. His decisiveness and his natural leadership skills, probably honed having spent several years in, in Dufinia, um, restored order. He killed the panic before it could even take hold. Well, not, it had taken hold, but he kind of stopped it just when, when he really, really needed to. But once entry to Colgan's had been secured, he ordered the men to keep tunnelling towards the other end of the block so that the, they could be spread out over, spread out in, in case of an enemy attack. They'd, they'd be able to, to open up, you know, flank and fire from a, a wide, from, from, its, its, from a, a wide area, possibly about 100 yards long. Um, this is where Captain George Plunk heard a wounded man crying for help, le leapt over his own barricade into enemy fire, uh, rescued a wounded enemy soldier, brought him back and put him next to James Connolly and had him treated by the same nurse who happened to be Elizabeth O'Farrell. Late into the night the, the leaders were moved to number 16, the new headquarters. Sean McLaughlin was, was asked to form a new plan. So by dawn on Saturday his plan was that they would attack the barricade at the end of Moore Street. But that would be a diversion. They'd also attack the barricade in nearby Moor Lane as a diversion for the diversion. It was pretty much a suicidal, <laughs> um, you know, there wasn't also a chance of, of survival, but men stepped forward regardless. And, and to put yourself into the mindset, not, not having stepped properly in days, been in combat, and then, you know, a, a lot of guys didn't step forward. You know, the last thing they were going to do, but, but enough did. But uh, ultimately it never happened because just before they were set to go, Pierce called McLaughlin back and told them that a ceasefire was to be arranged. He'd seen too many civilians being cut down and was no longer prepared to go on. So eventually, Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell was sent to the British barricade. Now she was fired on initially as she stepped out into Moore Street. So now, who knows what went through that incredibly brave woman's head as she stepped out of that doorway, but she, under fire, but she pressed on. As the ceasefire then took hold, volunteers literally collapsed with exhaustion. 
a lot of the civilians that were in, the, in that terrace that's so controversial today, um, they took great pity on them. You know, some of them weren't particularly enthused at what they were doing, especially in their houses. But you know, they did their best to feed them and see that they could get some rest. So eventually, a settlement was reached. Unconditional surrender was to be the order of the day. Now, most of the volunteers were aghast at the idea, particularly the young Englishmen and Scots who had travelled to Ireland to join the rebellion because they didn't want to be sent off to fight in the British army. Um, by the, they were Irish by, by parentage or whatever, but um, orders were orders. They had to surrender. And it was eventually agreed upon that the surrendered volunteers would emerge onto Moore Street, lay down their arms and proceed in order to Sackville Street where they were to line up outside the Gresham Hotel. Um, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, for starters, an advance party took a wrong turn, as they do, at Sackville Street and ended up at O'Connell Bridge by mistake. But when the main body began their march out, they shouldered their arms instead of laying them down. These were beaten, but they were unbowed. As they passed the ruined GPO, which had completely imploded at this stage, uh, Sean McLaughlin barked the command, eyes right, the GPO. A nearby volunteer pulled a tricolour from inside his tunic and attached it to the end of his rifle. The defiance didn't end there. As they lined up outside the Gresham, the forward line threw down their weapons and began taunting enemy soldiers by pressing their chests up against the bayonets of those who were now encircling them. While the rear line did the same, they pressed their backs into the bayonets of the soldiers behind them. General Lowe, who had accepted Pierce's surrender, ran at McLaughlin, berating him. McLaughlin was unimpressed, took out the ceremonial sword that had been given to him with his promotion, chucked it at the general's feet. But that wasn't the end of the fighting in Sackville Street or nor in Dublin because late on Saturday afternoon word had reached the four courts officially of the surrender but in North Brunswick Street it was a different story. They were still going at a hammer and tongs out there until a provisional ceasefire was arranged that evening when they eventually surrendered 19 year old Patrick Holohan, another Nafenia veteran who had also taken part in the assault on the magazine fort. Um, he'd taken charge of 60 men. The, the captain had, had been shot in the head. Um, but he eventually um, <coughs> they surrendered. When, when he led them out, he made a speech to them, and uh, some of the wording in the speech was, he told them he'd been proud to have served with them, but quote, the treatment you may expect in the future, you may judge from the past. Now, I would assume, however, that at this point, Holohan and his men had no idea of just how murderous that treatment had been to the local civilians over the course of the previous 36 hours, where 16 civilians were shot by the South Staffordshire's uh, into whose custody they were, they, Holohan and his men were now surrendering themselves. Sunday, April the 30th, the rest of the Republican garrisons individually surrendered to much protest from the vast majority of volunteers. First, there was the Citizen Army in St. Stephen's Green, followed by the 2nd Battalion in Jacobs, apparently, 4th Battalion in the South Dublin Union, and eventually 3rd Battalion in Bowlands. Now, the prevailing emotions of Dublin's civilian population was mixed, we mentioned earlier on. In some areas, the volunteers were heckled, abused, and in some cases, they were even assaulted by civilians who had to be held back by the British military. But in others, they were heralded as heroes. I mean, in Grand Canal Street, for example, they were applauded by weeping civilians, I mean, to, to offering to, to, to hide their weapons. The, the reaction by enemy soldiers was similarly mixed. Some wanted to rip their throats out, while others were keen to show respect to an enemy they underestimated at great cost to themselves. Now, over the course of the next six months or so, we're going to hear numerous accounts of what kind of people, the volunteers, the citizen army, the come on the mon, Fenia, Hibernian rifles were, particularly in terms of their fighting prowess. There will no doubt be dismissed in some quarters as fools and heralded as heroes and others. But I think that sometimes the most accurate appraisal in hindsight can sometimes come from former enemies because they're free of the need as they are to seek currency from any form of flattery. In that sense, we felt it best to leave the last word in the book to Constable Michael Sodley of the Dublin Metropolitan Police. And he was stationed at Kilmaine and Barracks during the executions which followed the Easter Rising. And he said, there was great admiration amongst the staff of the jail for the manner in which the executed leaders met their fate, especially Tom Clark, who notwithstanding his age and frail constitution, expressed his willingness to go before his firing party without a blindfold. I was also told that as far as the others were concerned, they did not care whether they were blindfolded or not. Death did not seem to hold any terrors for them. We'll take any comments or questions. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'll be
Thank you. Brilliant. And here's the top cards. Just before we get to the question answers, we're about to be kicked out, so but we'll just do the question answers. But if anyone's going, how much is your book for? Uh, uh, 15 quid. 15 quid, okay. So we'll load up there anyway, but we'll take a few questions. Yeah. Uh, just, a, just a quick comment. Two things. Uh, one, this is easily one of the best books that I've read on 1916. In terms of being accessible, it uh, gives you a completely different view on 1916. But my question is, what is the most uh, uncommon fact or maybe misinterpretation about 1916, do you think? Their, I think their expertise, the, yeah. the, 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 it, the, it's, it's, history's been very, very unfair to them. Yeah, it, 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 you know, but, but, uh, when the military, I mean, uh, we got a great review in on Cossentor magazine, which we were very, very grateful for, and, and to have it reviewed by the military when you're writing a book about combat, it was, it, we thought it was excellent. But, you know, and, and again, you know, the, the Irish Defence Forces, I mean, they were gobsmacked. That's what we heard by the, the tactical ability of, of, of the, these, these men and women. So I, I think that, that would be it. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to compliment uh, the energy and the enthusiasm you had. Absolutely. And, uh, they, the book is not like the delivery of, of the <laughs> yeah. it's not, for the, not for the faint heart, <laughs> neither are we. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. definitely not. No, but it's, it's a credit to you, Ali, know, just being on our talks and, and hearing on it. But it just, yeah, have you got, would you have any plans to go to work with young people like in the outside? Would you have any plans of maybe bringing it as a, a talk and kind of a workshop or something like that? Because oh, I'd love to, yeah, it needs really to get out there. I've no problem with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. any, any avenue we have to, to, to get this story out there. And, and again, I get the opportunity here to say that I come from a non political point of view. I'm into military history, and I find this a particularly riveting episode in the history of warfare. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it is a story I think that, that should be told. I'm not into war, I think it's bloody awful. But you know, let's face it, history is, is you know, one way or another, it's people trying to bump each other off for, for whatever reason. I, I like studying military history because uh, it, it gives you a great insight into the human character. You see people at their best and at their very worst. And who doesn't like to study people? But, but I, I think that any opportunity to get the story of Dublin, um, you know, you know, you go to the States where they have reenactments of battles there, they love broadcasting and out to the world. You had a huge reenactment of, of the Battle of Waterloo um, you know, earlier on this year. You know, it goes on all over the world and I think it's about time we got over our inferiority complex and stood out and said to the world what, what we did here. <laughs> and Dick. And Dick, yeah. the, the thing about City Hall, I think, wasn't just that it was City Hall, it was that it was Dublin Castle. And Dublin Castle had been the centre of British uh, rule in Ireland, uh, administration and repression yeah. since yeah. 1169, yeah. Uh, or even before if you take the Viking uh, occupation. So uh, its symbolic significance was huge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think that was an important uh, reason why it wasn't just a strategic uh, military point of view. That's why the attack was so fierce on there, I think. I, um, and the other thing I wanted to say was that um, I think uh, you, you talked about firing from uh, Jacobs uh, to su support the, um, the, the, the resistance on... Um, uh, on um, on the bridge. Portobello Port Bridge. Port Bello, yeah. Uh, no, not on Portobello, on um, on the other bridge. Oh, Mount? Yeah. Mount Street, oh, yeah. Fire from uh, Bolands. From Bolands, yeah. Okay. So apparently what they were doing, they were firing, uh, they, were, they were firing from great distance, and apparently they were even firing from Jacobs. Uh, they were firing at what they could see a uh, glint of uh, bayonets. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, most of the volunteers around that, that park were no longer using bayonets. So when you see bayonets kind of going across, and that's, that's even back to the Middle Ages when uh, you could see troops from a distance because of the uh, light shining on their spear tops or, yeah. or whatever. And, and quite often in those situations, then if they wanted to go into an area uh, quietly, they would cover themselves with, uh, with a cloak or a blanket so it couldn't be seen from the distance. But I just thought that was uh, peculiar. Just, just see a glint over the distance of fire. It's quite ominous as well when you think about it. You know, when, when we were writing about this, you know, and, and Darren said it to me about, you know, they're aiming at belt buckles. That's not a nice, that's not an attractive prospect. <laughs> <laughs> so we should be throwing their sights down at this area of your body. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs>
<laughs> I just want to say as well about we have an awful uh, self-loading problem in this country about facing up to our history, especially history of the uh, 19th and 20th century as well. Like we had a big reenactment there of the Battle of Tarf last year. Everyone out dressed up as Vikings and all this, yeah. like, and, that, and that's acceptable. But anything in this kind of more modern era is that you know, keep your head down, say nothing. And this, this, this kind of went through all the early days of the, of the free state and everything. But the important thing I've seen in uh, one of the videos I've seen about you where you likened the, the defence up on Mount Street and Northumberland Road to basically like Ireland's Thermopylae. Yeah. Like, you know, I didn't coin that now. I, I, I know, I, but I it's get, brilliant. Yeah. It was the first yeah. time I've heard it. And yeah. again, if you think of the amount of uh, traction you can get out of that in terms of tourism and get this narrative out there of a couple of people defending the against thousands. The yeah. Alamo. That's what the, the couple of American tourists that when we were over there with Marcus there fi filming, uh, I, I couldn't believe this. Now, the, these were, were uh, two women, they were, they were just American tourists, but and they heard us talking about this, this and, and the bullet holes in the building and they were like, oh my God, you know, you've got bullet holes, you know, so I brought her around and showed her the bullet holes on, on the southern side of the schoolhouse and I explained to her the numbers, you know, that, that, that there was 13 holding off, you know, over 1,600 and straight away, so this is your Alamo. Yeah, That's what she said. That. that was the wrong war. <laughs> but but it's yeah, just in the, the point of view of I mean that's sacred ground. I mean I, I love heavy metal. Ozzy Osbourne was on the radio last week talking about you know he can't go back to the Alamo because uh, he needed to take a leak there forty odd years ago. But, but they, they still haven't yeah, yeah. made their peace over yeah. that. This is you know it's sacred ground to them. But I, I think that that um, you know similar places like Mount Street Bridge, you know the, the schoolhouse. I can't understand why it isn't. Um, like, like put it this way, you know, one day I was driving past there on April 26th a couple of years ago and I saw a poppy wreath outside number 25. Now this was the Sherwood Foresters. They wanted to come over and put something there for, for, for their dead. I mean, personally, I have no problem with that. You know, they, these were young men who were, you know, conscripted into the British Army, a lot of them, and told to go there and do this. I mean, they didn't hate the Irish. They probably did after that day. But up, up until then, but, but these were young men sent into combat. And they, they, they're... they're Modern organisations were, were willing to come over here and lay a wreath on, on number 25 Northumberland Road. It was done quite respectfully, I might add, because they weren't getting in anybody's faces like the crowd who did it last yeah, week. Yeah. But having said that, if they're willing to do that, why the hell can't we? Was it a poppy wreath though? I thought it was, no, it was, it was, a, it was a poppy wreath. Oh, it, well, it was a big thing, and, and this is a, a deliberate ploy within the early Free State years, is the, they don't like the romantic, romanticisation of Irish history. And that's, that's also one thing that's always kind of drawn me to it. From a young age, seeing pictures of Kevin Barry and all these people, find out who they were, why they were so young, why they had no fear when they faced the noose of a firing squad, all these things. It is, it is romantic. We're, we're Irish, terrible. we're romantic, get yeah. over it. It's, it. That's what we do. We're a nation yeah. of saints and scholars. We, we like to put music and, and, and you know, that, that's, we're, we're the Shanna Key, we're the storytellers. That's what we do. It, it's always going to be romantic. Why the hell shouldn't it be bloody romantic? This, 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 this is human emotion at its most extreme. It's, it's, it's as romantic as it gets in, in terms of... In, Just briefly before you finish, I'll let see the way it's going to go out. Uh, sorry. Next year, we'll have this, this uh, reconciliation. Sorry, this is the real book. Sorry. Just yeah, before, I'll let you make a point. I haven't been in here all the evening. I know, no, no. Somebody, no, no, somebody, 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 that. somebody <laughs> else has the real book. Somebody else has the real book. No, I didn't sorry. Sorry, I was going to go. I'm going to talk there. I'm going to talk there. I'm going to talk there. Everybody, that's my only contribution to the internet. I'm going to have to finally work this man here. Next year, the reconciliation, the people coming across the wall there to do their, whatever they have to do for their fall and that fell here in Dublin. Okay, that may, everybody has their own opinions and I don't have my own personal opinion on that, but in this area in particular, I don't think it has any place, especially on our King Street, where 15 people for the there. Yeah, I understand that. Now, I was at a meeting there a little while ago there where it was, it was muted at the meeting there that there were a whole series of things going on and reconciliation came up and the man was nearly caught asunder. Now, I know the people down there they, they had fallen out of it. The South Staffordshire went down the road brutally and brutally yeah. slaughtered them people. Yeah. And there was, they weren't soldiers against soldiers. They no. weren't combatants. No. They weren't, they that's weren't that's the opposite end of the yeah. spectrum. That's more. Yeah. And whatever else about the rest of the city, that argument is out there. We're setting you on this car. I mean, for, no. for, I, I hear you, and, and I mean, I, my spin on that would, would be, I mean, look, look, look again, I, I'm, I'm detached here, you know, yeah. if you, if you, if you look, look at, and that's, that's not out of a personal failing, it's just the, that's the way I approach it, but you look at, you know, Germany and France, you know, when, when it's commemorations, the, the Germans will be invited to certain areas, they certainly won't so be brought back to Orador or Glam, <laughs> where, you know, that, that's, that's not going to happen, so, so I think that's a very good point, and I think it should be approached in reconciliation with great sensitivity. And thanks very much for your time.